Hi, I'm Gary Cotton, and this is Gilad Zlotkin. I'm a staff engineer at VMware, and Gilad's uh, the VP of uh, Cloud at Radware. Um, we're going to be presenting um, a few ideas on differentiated services and how they're related to differentiated uh, scheduling. And basically, how did we come upon this idea? Is at the moment, Nova relates to all kinds of resources in the same way. And we'd basically like um, Nova, Nova to have some kind of differentiated scheduling, which is triggered according to um, types of service or special applications. Um, and basically, we're going to explain various ideas um, that are going on in the community and developments and current support that enable one to perform some kind of differentiated services and hopefully kind of provide an uh, enterprise-grade cloud so that people can run uh, mission-critical mission applications on it. So essentially, kind of the, the idea is hopefully one day to get uh, OpenStack to be enterprise-ready. What exactly does that mean? It means that OpenStack should somehow or another be able to make use or to run uh, mission-critical applications in the public cloud, that is kind of applications which today are run in the private cloud, which are highly available, which have very good performance, uh, which have guaranteed security, and basically they're compliant with existing architectures at the moment, which are multi-tier and uh, various fault uh, tolerance models. And throughout our presentation, we'll describe these and kind of go into various features that, uh, that Nova has, and we'll provide some kind of details on uh, future developments to show how things can, can be improved and what can be leveraged at the moment. So in terms of availability, there are uh, several models of availability. We are trying to oversimplify them, but we call fault tolerance uh, to... We call fault tolerance to a application architecture that actually able to sustain a single server failure. Sometimes it's more than single failure. It means that any fault uh, is, uh, is it's resilient to any fault, so the application continues to be available. Uh, there is no even recovery uh, time. High availability, it's uh, something that would uh, take the application between seconds and minutes to recover. And uh, usually when we're talking about uh, disaster recovery, it's within uh, hours and sometimes uh, days uh, to recover. So uh, we just want to make those terms so we will know what we are talking about when we are looking at different uh, architecture and how we're going to support them uh, migration, uh, migrating to OpenStack. When we talk about performance, so usually it's, it's uh, measured in two uh, different uh, metrics, uh, transaction latency, a millisecond uh, up to seconds, and transaction uh, load, transaction per second, okay? So when we are trying to optimize availability, we mainly talk about fault tolerance. When we, talk, uh, when we try to optimize on performance, we actually relate to both of those metrics. And when we talk about security, there are several issues. We are not covering all of them right now. It's mainly data uh, privacy, data integrity, and uh, be able uh, to sustain a denial of service uh, attack. And uh, we will uh, address some of those issues. Uh, and you're probably wondering uh, how all those issues related uh, to the Nova Scheduler. Well, it does. It does, and uh, uh, we will explain exactly how a scheduling policy uh, can be triggered to address each and every service level requirement on, on this uh, board. Uh, so when we talk about uh, high availability model, there is the availability zone uh, architecture, which is very uh, cloud oriented and actually not many uh, enterprise application, legacy enterprise application are using this model for high availability or certainly not for uh, fault uh, resiliency. We have server redundancy. This is the classic enterprise uh, high availability model. And of course, uh, we have both. And actually, I would classify this is the enterprise disaster recovery way. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see in details what those uh, architectures are. So this is the cloud, a uh, classic uh, high availability uh, uh, architecture. 
since uh, you cannot really uh, uh, know on which uh, VM, on which uh, host uh, each VM uh, uh, is placed, then you can design your uh, application to be resilient to the entire zone uh, failure. Okay, so that would be uh, oversimplify typical uh, high availability model where database is being replicated is an either uh, synchronously in a two-phase commit or asynchronously. Uh, and actually every server failure, certainly the database but or the load balancer, every server failure, it's a kind of a disaster recovery failover uh, uh, to the backup uh, uh, domain. A global load balancing is typically done by uh, uh, DNS load balancing. So the global load balancing may be able to automatically detect a load balancing failure and uh, fail over automatically, but certainly won't, will not be able to detect, at least not immediately, database failure or any uh, uh, web, web server failure. So uh, the detection of the failure may take uh, several uh, minutes or, or seconds. Uh, uh, so this would, I would, I would uh, classify this as high availability and not necessarily a fault tolerance. Uh, architecture. A fault tolerance architecture, this is would be a typical fault tolerance architecture that you will find in enterprise mission critical. Uh, you have load balancer and you have a backup load balancer. You have uh, at least one additional uh, web server. Uh, so even if uh, one server is down, you have sufficient capacity uh, to support uh, uh, the transaction uh, rate that application need to provide. And you have uh, two databases that are synchronized, and this is actually a uh, local synchronization. The previous, uh, in the previous model, uh, this would be a, a synchronization of cross-zone uh, communication, and actually this is a cost, uh, uh, it, it, it cost, it cost money uh, to communicate between uh, zone typically in uh, public cloud. Um, so this would be, uh, a server redundancy, and it's basically designed to be resilient to any single server uh, failure. And that, that, that is a typical uh, enterprise mission critical architecture, and it would be interesting to see what it means to take application with this uh, high availability model and migrate them to OpenStack, and this is exactly what we are focusing on. Uh, another model, of course, is the combination of both, so you have uh, server resiliency in each uh, zone, and when either more than one server fails or the connectivity to the zone fail or all the zone fail, then of course you can use uh, the backup zone. Uh, I'm looking now on active-active uh, configuration. Actually in some uh, deployment you don't really need four databases, it's sufficient to have one in each location. So if the database server fails, th this is a disaster recovery event, okay? Uh, and uh, this can uh, be configured to be t uh, fully fault tolerant. It means uh, zero recovery time, or uh, depends, depends exactly how uh, the database synchronization uh, is managed, okay? Uh, so let's talk about other availability models that require Kind of with the advent of um, SDN, kind of basically the networking also becomes uh, an issue where basically the logical and the transport networks also need to be highly available and somebody needs to guarantee that they're also up and available. So for example, VMware's NSX, which would be a highly ava available solution to manage the network traffic between um, the various instances as Gilad's uh, displayed. So say for example, if um, one of the networks goes down, the NSX will ensure kind of that the various uh, flows are built correctly so that traffic can get to and from the various instances or the um, virtual machines that are running within the cloud. And in addition to guaranteeing the um, highly available traffic, another thing which is very important is to have um, highly available um, controllers. So basically not just having uh, no single point of failure is something which is also very important. High availability also need to be built into the load balancer uh, itself, as you saw before. It typically, we have uh, two load balancers instances. Uh, one uh, 
uh, active one standby, and there is a continuous uh, uh, update of uh, synchronization of configuration and synchronization of persistent state. So the failover will result with minimal impact of uh, incoming uh, transaction, uh, even zero impact on incoming transaction. And the standby uh, load balancer actually uh, check the livelihood of the active uh, load balancer when the active load balancer is down. So the standby automatically takes over. This is uh, also almost instantly uh, uh, done. So uh, this is a full fault uh, resilient architecture. This is typical uh, uh, Radvor uh, Alton uh, support that and then other load balancer uh, support that. Uh, just just uh, as an example, uh, in OpenStack, you will find high availability uh, HA proxy uh, implementation. Uh, unfortunately, HA proxy does not support uh, 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 auto failover uh, to standby uh, instance. And for mission critical application, you will need uh, to deploy something like that, okay, to provide high availability to the load balancing layer. So, High availability is one, is one ups, uh, aspect. Uh, we will uh, visit the other aspect of performance and uh, security. Uh, but just for high availability, it uh, leads us to uh, understand that we need to schedule uh, application like this, uh, seven, uh, seven VM application as a group rather than uh, as independent uh, placement uh, uh, procedure, uh, just to make sure they are not being placed on the same server, and uh, we will see an example to that, just to make sure they are uh, being placed in close proximity to each other on the network, so there will be uh, a low latency in all these uh, cross or in internal uh, application communication, and uh, there might be other uh, aspects like security which we'll uh, visit. So basically this is a group scheduling initiative, we started it uh, more than a year ago, and it's ongoing effort, and uh, we will uh, share with you what is the state of the project, what was already done, and what we are planning to do going forward uh, to support mission-critical application uh, in OpenStack. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna provide an example on how OpenStack does um, scheduling of various instances, and to basically show how the example that we've used from the start of a highly available um, redundant application can be deployed in the cloud. So initially kind of the um, the scheduling at the moment in OpenStack is kind of best efforts. One can make use of scheduling hints but those are a bit kind of laborious and cumbersome. So basically one could say deploy the application that's shown in the picture and OpenStack could have say a bad um, network, sorry, um, host selection where exactly the same um, virtual machines are deployed on exactly the same hosts. What's the problem here? If that there's host failure, the whole application goes down. And kind of there's a high probability of host failure in the cloud, and so that's something which can certainly happen. So the ideal solution to that is to do anti-affinity. Just, sorry, taking one step back. Over here, kind of the, the gray squares are the squares that are utilized already on the host, and the white ones are free. So we see that certain instances can only be placed on certain hosts. Kind of the scheduling decision is something that's not trivial, and it's something that requires kind of a great overview of the whole picture of the system at a current point in time. So as I explained, it's kind of a bad scheduling decision. Could say put the two database servers on the same host. <coughs> and say, for example, that host goes down, the whole application goes down. Okay. So what we've proposed with the, with the group scheduling is to have a placement uh, strategy which is anti-affinity, which enables fault tolerance. What does that mean? is that none of the same instances will be placed on the same host. So what we can see here is that the database will be placed on host two and the database will be placed on host three. So if one of those hosts goes down, the application will still be up and running. And their kind of disaster recovery, that becomes uh, another issue on how to bring those uh, applications back to life. So in order to do that, we've got a number of placement strategies. So anti-affinity is one example. Uh, again, without uh, giving uh, scheduler hints, uh, we would never know if uh, two VMs that actually backupping each other are not uh, end up uh, resigning of on, the, on the same host. Uh, 
and this is this is the first uh, uh, policy for a performance uh, uh, to uh, to assure performance. Uh, there are other uh, placement policy we want to take into consideration. One of them is network proximity. So we need to make sure uh, uh, all application VMs are uh, close to each other on the network. Uh, as uh, Gary said before, uh, placement currently is best effort, and uh, the Nova uh, placement takes only Nova consideration, doesn't really uh, take uh, networking consideration. Uh, and we need to combine uh, those uh, uh, two considerations uh, to provide network proximity. Uh, another aspect is host capability. You know, uh, the, the cloud uh, may have different types of uh, host, some of them stronger, some of them uh, as uh, SSDs, some of them are better connected to the internet, some of them are uh, closer uh, to the storage, and uh, we uh, want to take uh, those uh, aspects into consideration uh, when we are doing the placement. Maybe the database uh, uh, VM should be in close proximity to the storage be be because it's a heavy, heavy IO uh, requirement, and we need to take those considerations into account. Security, this is another uh, big uh, item. Uh, here, uh, we are starting to cover what we call the uh, resource isolation or exclusivity. So you may want uh, that your VM will never share a host with a VM for, from another tenant. You don't trust uh, the hypervisor to prevent other uh, VMs to uh, sniff into your memory and uh, read your uh, data after it was dec decrypted, okay? There are maybe many reasons for you uh, to insist of having uh, exclusive uh, resources. It can be uh, compute resources, of course it can be network resources and others. Yes? What about the compute resources? Of course, that, that would be uh, the scheduler uh, responsibility to do a, a global, a global uh, consideration and the, the placement request uh, may be failed, and you can uh, reply by saying, I cannot, I cannot place uh, this request. I don't have enough space, there is conflict between the requirement, and the customer will uh, decide if he wants to relax some of the constraint, or uh, he needs to call up the administrator uh, to solve the problem. Even today, you may, you may submit a, a a placement request uh, that may not be able to be admitted because there is no space. Okay, so it's it's the same the same uh, case. Yeah. Uh, depends what the time now actually. <laughs> What's the time? Okay. Yes. Yes. Slide eleven. That thirteen. Yes. Talking about BPRP, uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure if I understand the, the uh, question, but the basically, you want them to be on two separate layers, two domains? No, the question is if you have one, one layer that is like for the compute or RAM, yes. you have three layers with two domains. Yeah, yeah. You just think about what the question was. Yes, yeah, there, there must be a sort of protocol called uh, BRRP. Right, so yeah. if someone is actually having the attack, you think about that as two separate layers. Basically, it's a protocol which was uh, written by, by Cisco called BRRP. Do we need the, the mic? Or yeah. But BRRP works with different layer three domains. But basically, the, the question was for in load balancing how to do failover between different uh, layer three domains. Kind of the, the, the basically, if I understand correctly, and I may be a bit rusty, is that um, 
basically over here for the load balancer, people are turning to an IP address. And that IP address is kind of note, um, is, is um, broadcast across the system. And who's ever publishing that address is the owner of that uh, IP address. So basically, say load balancer one will have the, it will be the primary device. And that's the one which is kind of advertising itself that I'm up, kind of everybody turned to me, and load balancer one will um, publish a, a MAC address for, for its um, IP address. Um, the, the fact that load balancing one is up, it's basically sending kind of notification messages to the network, which uh, anybody who's, who's monitoring a VRF is kind of listening to that. So for example, um, load balancer two, it's listening to that multicast uh, address and it will see that load balancer one is up. That message is sent every few seconds. So when load balancer one stops receiving those messages, it will publish the, the, the virtual IP address that it's the owner. And as far as kind of my understanding is that works on different layer three domains. La layer two domains, sorry. Okay. okay. Okay, so, so basically we've done a lot of the, we've, th we've shown a lot of pictures and given a lot of uh, explanations. Now we'd actually like to show what exactly is implemented in OpenStack to try and describe also what's missing and kind of, um, I'd like to say huge strides that we're taking to, to make it uh, uh, a lot better, but kind of following a few discussions from yesterday, we could say a few baby steps which are, which are being made to, to progress things. So in, uh, originally in Grizzly, um, we added an anti-affinity hint, which qu kind of was extended a little bit in Havana, which basically when somebody boots an instance, you're able to pass a scheduling hint, which says kind of you're associating that specific instance with a group. What does that mean? If you deploy another group with the same, uh, another instance with the same group, then an anti-affinity scheduling decision will take place. Basically that means that the scheduling placement will decide on two different hosts for the placement. At the Havana um, summit um, in Portland in April, kind of we extended that, kind of originally Gilad and I, we had a proposal for something which was called VM, VM ensembles, and that evolved to something called instance groups. Where basically today, um, sadly we never managed to make it into the Havana cycle with the instance groups, but we're literally kind of uh, towards the end of the finish line and hopefully we'll be able to get it in soon. So I'll describe basically what an instance group is. For example, um, somebody's able to define an instance group and each instance group has a, a policy. At the moment, the supported policies are anti-affinity. Additional policies that we'd like to add in the future are um, network proximity, uh, host capabilities, um, for example. Um, in addition to this, each instance group will be able to display which members are currently part of the instance group. Um, in addition to that, um, somebody could uh, append kind of some key value pair data that uh, we don't want to have strict configuration and to be able to flow with data that's kind of um, extendable and usable kind of within the scheduler. And as I mentioned, kind of sadly, this never really made it into um, Havana, but uh, Yesterday it seems like we've got uh, some kind of approval to get it into Icehouse and hopefully we'll be able to get this in uh, pretty soon. Um, just an example of... Uh, uh, no, Horizon's not updated at the moment because first of all the instance groups never got in. Yeah, uh, may maybe in Icehouse or I hope, kind of crossing my fingers. Okay. Um, as, as an example, kind of we've displayed the, um, the anti-affinity. Now kind of I'd like to give an example of uh, network proximity. Say for example, somebody's using blade servers in different racks. Kind of the initial naive uh, placement in, in uh, the, the, the scheduler could be that the whole application that we've got on the left-hand side over here could be kind of placed randomly across racks and across blades within the racks. So basically that could mean that the performance of the application isn't great. Kind of if your database isn't sitting close to the web server, then the access to the web pages could uh, take a long time and kind of the user experience could not as be as, as good as it would be expected. So kind of using network proximity, we'll be able to place, kind of using also anti-affinity to the applications kind of as close to one another as possible on the same blades within the same rack. 
So that will provide kind of, as shown before, kind of a highly available and a very optimal performance uh, setup. Okay. In addition to that, kind of as Gilad mentioned, we'd like to take things into account uh, are the host capabilities. For example, um, I.O. intensive uh, applications, uh, CPU intensive applications, and also network uh, intensive applications. And to basically reflect these ideas, kind of there were a number of uh, proposals at the, at the recent summit. Kind of the one was a smart resource placement by Yati and Debu. Um, Yati is sitting in the back over there, so basically he's here to, to do that. And he's kind of got a nice scheduling uh, patch which uh, enables one to, to do things like that. In addition to that, there's a guy, Doug, from, uh, from Intel, who he's, uh, kind of wants to extend host capabilities to enable the scheduling to take that into account. Um, one, one of the issues which also has come up a number of times is storage proximity. Essentially what we'd like to do is have the volume, kind of that, the cinder volume, run as close as possible to the actual uh, instance that's running because the, the access to the storage will be optimized and, and a lot better. Um, this has been re addressed kind of in uh, two places at the moment. Kind of one is uh, scheduling across services, which that was uh, sadly a topic which wasn't really addressed at the summit. It was brought up, discussed a lot, and kind of essentially I think everybody came to the conclusion that kind of we're not ready for that yet, and uh, hopefully next uh, in six months' time we'll be able to discuss it. But I think kind of my, my gut feeling is when we get to Europe we'll still be discussing the, the same issue. And then back also kind of uh, Yati and Debu's uh, proposal with the smart resource placement also takes that into account. So resource isolation, uh, you're probably familiar with the uh, Amazon Web Services uh, a virtual private uh, cloud service. It's basically a, a cloud service that dedicates resources specifically for tenant. Uh, and uh, we, we thought we can, we can provide a similar type of service without actually upfront dedicated uh, given capacity per tenant. It can be done on a per server request and we, we call this uh, resource exclusivity. And this can also be uh, a, Nova, a Nova placement uh, a hint that all, all uh, VMs belongs to a certain application or to a certain tenant uh, should not share uh, resources. It can be storage resource, it can be compute resource, it can be a network resource with any other tenant, okay? Instead of actually dedicating uh, a physical infrastructure for, uh, uh, for tenant uh, like VPC, uh, we can do that on a shared uh, uh, resource uh, a cloud uh, um, a service provisioning, but still uh, be able to allocate a specific cost per, uh, per tenant, okay? And actually there is uh, some activity around that. Um, ba basically, the, there was one uh, design session that was spent on the, on the issue that's to basically enable p uh, private clouds, or which HP refers to as uh, P clouds. Um, that's something being driven by Phil Day and uh, Andrew Lasky. Basically, the idea is to take the notion of host aggregates, which today are configurable by an admin user, and to expand that so that a user can also create some kind of aggregate where, where kind of um, host allocation is uh, something which can be controlled by, by the user. What does that mean? Is basically a user can deploy kind of a, a cloud within a cloud where they'll have their own uh, dedicated hosts, and kind of as Gilad mentioned, kind of they can have uh, security and performance and all kinds of enhancements which aren't uh, really guaranteed in the public cloud today. Um, a few additional scheduling topics that came up and which were dealt with. Um, one, there's been an effort by the guys from Marantis and led by Boris to improve the, the scheduling performance. That's basically kind of to try and uh, lower the amount of interactions with the database and to try and cache information locally on the hosts. Um, in addition to that, kind of the allocation and the management of the host statistics um, is also something being discussed that was by the guys from, um, from Intel. Um, also kind of one of the contentious issues is kind of how is all of the scheduling data gathered and accessed. 
kind of one is somebody can read it directly from the from the hypervisor, and then two, there's this uh, this monitoring and metering uh, feature in OpenStack called Solometer. So, which kind of how we're going to gather these statistics for for the schedule and how we're going to to use this? That's uh, something that's been dealt with by Paul Murray from uh, from HP. And in addition to this, there was a feature added by a few guys from eight, uh, from IBM in the last cycle, which also sadly didn't make it. That's for somebody to make use of uh, multiple schedulers. Kind of today, the scheduling in OpenStack's global. You define in a configuration file which scheduling filters you want to run. And basically, they proposed kind of you can have scheduling policies. For certain applications, you can have certain schedulers which are running. So for certain applications, you may want to run just, uh, say, a RAM filter. And for others, you want to run kind of a say, anti-affinity filters. So they enable one kind of to dynamically decide which uh, filters are going to be used. Um, basically, in, uh, in Icehouse, what we, what we wanted to do and what was discussed yesterday was to expand on the work for, for instance groups, where this was a collaboration done with uh, Debo and Yati from Cisco and Mike from IBM, who's, who's sitting here. And basically, the idea was to have kind of a tree which we could schedule at once and to define how this would be managed and, and accessed uh, in OpenStack. The, the problem was that um, the discussion seemed to, to focus around the fact that heat is responsible maybe for the orchestration and the management. And the general feeling was that this is something at the moment which is too complex for the Nova scheduler. So kind of we've gone back to the drawing board and we'll have to rethink uh, a few of these ideas. And basically the consensus was that we should go back to the initial um, instance group uh, support and hopefully build, build upon that. So I'm just going to describe a little bit about the instance groups so that people can get a bit more of an idea. And then basically how that can be used and hopefully within Icehouse in the first uh, milestone we'll be able to, to get this through. So essentially, each instance group will have a unique UUID, and that will be what will be used to, to reference the, the instance group throughout all of the interactions with it. It will also have a human-readable name. The, the name kind of in OpenStack, the names aren't unique. Kind of the uniqueness comes through the UUID. Um, each tenant will be able to own their own um, instance group. And as mentioned before, each instance group can have its set of policies, for example, the anti-affinity, network proximity, or host capabilities. And at the moment, kind of each instance group, one will be able to read the, the members that are in within the instance group. Uh, one of the changes that we wanted to make was for somebody to be able to configure the members and their properties. So that's something which uh, <coughs> that's pending for the next version. So at the moment, I'll describe the flow for the anti-affinity filter. Basically, a user will create uh, an instance group. <coughs> that instance group will be assigned the, a policy for, for anti-affinity. When somebody does the, the scheduling, somebody will do Nova boot and they'll pass the, the instance group UUID as a scheduling hint to, to Nova. Nova will kind of select the host which doesn't have any of the instances which are in the group that are, that are running. And that basically, once the, the instance has been selected, the member will be added to the instance group so that that can be used for, for future reference. And kind of as I wrote here, basically, there's a uh, pending support for for group of groups, which sadly yesterday was uh, was knacked, so we should have deleted that bullet item. Um, and essentially, group members will be removed when an instance is uh, is deleted. And uh, so, in the debate of uh, whether a cloud should be application ready or application should be cloud ready, we actually believe both. You know. Uh, and most of the uh, workload that currently run in cloud environment are basically applications that were written specifically to run on cloud. And we see a lot of opportunity helping existing application, mission critical application uh, to the cloud. And to enable that, the cloud need, need to be application ready. And it doesn't really mean too much, you know, just uh, some uh, uh, key features in the placement uh, and uh, in the anti-affinity, proximity, resource exclusivity. And what's uh, important also here, it's uh, the aspect of, di of differentiated service. It's not that every application needs every feature, okay? But the same cloud infrastructure, instead of providing the same service to all applications, the same best effort service 
for all application may require to provide different services to different application, but still within the same cloud uh, service uh, delivery environment, okay? You don't need to create different cells for each service level. You can combine, you can uh, uh, deliver differentiated services on the same cloud infrastructure by, for example, implementing differentiated uh, scheduling policies, okay? Uh, and uh, this is basically uh, uh, the message here. Uh, I believe uh, best effort, uh, it was a very good uh, starting point. Uh, and uh, it does address uh, uh, many type of workload, but the next step would be uh, starting to implement specific feature to make OpenStack enterprise ready. And this is exactly what we are working on. Actually, you are welcome uh, to see a demo of a, a load balancing failover in OpenStack in, uh, in the Radver uh, boot. It, it works uh, and you can see it in front of your eyes and uh, it's zero, uh, uh, zero recovery time. Um, and uh, you are welcome to start using anti-affinity. It's part of Havana, even though it's not accessible through Horizon, but it does have uh, full accessibility through the API. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah, I wanted to say that the networking guys are raising the level of abstraction of the networking uh, uh, APIs to be more like what we're talking about here. And uh, you raise another interesting dimension, which is talking about specifically about prioritizing between applications, which is a useful additional dimension to add both here and in the networking. Any more questions? I wonder, you made a statement at the very end that you said that the first attempt was pretty good, right? It gets you, you know, gets you going, but obviously there's a lot, as you outlined, a lot of additional needs and requirements. I wonder how much of this you think, there's almost like an 80-20 rule, you know, which of the stuff or the things that you discussed today, and I'm not looking for an answer, but I think we need to think about it as a group, what are the priorities? Which ones are most critical now? And do we iterate through these, trying, instead of trying to solve all of them in one shot and waiting three or four cycles? Because if you solve a couple of the problems that you have, we'll make a big dent on the, the overall challenges. So, so basically, the order that we choose, uh, we believe this is also the priority, starting with availability, and then to performance, and only in the end for uh, security. Uh, security guys don't like that, but yeah, I agree. Uh, no, because. Uh, because I believe uh, the hypervisor uh, provides sufficient security to start with, uh, and uh, this is uh, basically the roadmap uh, that we are pursuing. It's not certainly not going to be all at once. Certainly not <laughs> in the open stack pace. Okay, uh, and we are taking the small steps, incremental steps, uh, and we are uh, taking incremental steps in, in in providing the framework that would support all of these uh, scenarios. So I think what is more important is the framework that support various kinds of policies. And as you think, each of those scenarios they mentioned uh, translates to some policy ultimately. What what has to be implemented and supported uh, in the in in NOAA scheduling, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're running out of time. Very good. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you.